So binary star evolution is what leads to um, nova and type one supernova. Uh, and these are related to uh, binary systems where one of the stars becomes a white dwarf while the other one stays on the main sequence. So my question for you is if we have a binary star system where one of the primary stars becomes a white dwarf and the other star remains on the main sequence, which star must be more massive? All right, I see the most votes for the primary star. Um, why would the primary star be more massive than the secondary star? Yep, exactly. And so since it reached its um, end of its life cycle before the main sequence star, then we know it must be higher up on the HR diagram. It must be a higher mass star. All right, so another question, what is the mass limit of a white dwarf star? All right, I see most votes for B, 1.4 times the mass of the sun, that's correct. So our white dwarf star here in its binary partner, the main sequence star, um, they can interact together in the same way that the black hole can interact with its partner. And so there are two things that can happen in such a system. One, if the main sequence star that's left over goes red giant, some of that um, envelope mass can be funneled onto the white dwarf star. If it's just a little bit of mass, then the stolen hydrogen from the envelope of its binary partner will ignite on its surface and, and cause an increase in luminosity by around uh, 100 to 1,000 times. So we would see this as a sudden increase in brightness from that star system, but it would uh, fade over the course of weeks. On the other hand, if the red giant star uh, produces so much, you know, transfers too much mass to the white dwarf and it exceeds that 1.4 mass limit, then this will cause the, all of the mass that it receives and all of the white dwarf itself to explode in a burst of sudden fusion. And this would increase the luminosity by millions of times. And this could not happen repeatedly over time. It would only occur once because it would destroy the remnant. So the nova can occur repeatedly and it's just a small luminosity increase, but the type one supernova destroys the white dwarf and occurs um, rapidly, increases luminosity by a lot more. Uh, so if we wanted to measure the light curves for a nova versus a supernova, um, this is what it would look like. Your textbook doesn't go into this, so I borrowed this from a different textbook. Don't tell the publisher. Um, but anyway, the light curve, the luminosity over time for a nova increases only by 100 to 1,000 times, and it lasts between, well, this particular light curve, about 100 days, so a few months. Um, whereas if you have a type 1 supernova, that's this green curve, the luminosity increases by millions of times, and then it fades over months. Um, and it fades relatively slowly over time before it reaches its original luminosity again. Um, a type two supernova, which is the kind that leaves behind a neutron star or a black hole, um, the luminosity increase for that is very high and very sudden, comparable to a type one, but even more um, bright and even more fast. And then this plateaus for a while before it falls off again. So the brightness timing and the brightness amount um, can help us distinguish between these different events. Okay, um, that's pretty much all I have to tell you about binary star evolution, but you'll explore it more in your activity and your homework. So just to review what we talked about, because they're kind of different topics, um, neutron stars are dense, rapidly spinning, they have strong magnetic fields, and they produce these lighthouse beams that may or may not um, sweep across Earth from our point of view, depending on their orientation. Um, we also talked about black holes as objects that stretch space-time to their extreme. And then now we've seen that binary stars can impact each other in their evolution process, specifically when a white dwarf star and a main sequence star are in a binary system together, then uh, the white dwarf can go nova or it can go type one supernova.